Thanks for tuning in to High Green, the Boston and Maine Railroad Historical Society's official podcast. High Green is funded by your membership in the Boston and Maine Railroad Historical Society, and any opinions expressed throughout the show are solely those of the owner. We hope you enjoyed today's show, and as always, if you're interested in learning more about our organization, you can visit our website, www.bmrrhs.org. Perhaps this story hasn't been told in b and circles, but no. it's a B&M story, and it's a good one. And the next thing you know, we hear 119 getting out of town with his steam engine working like the hell. He's going up by way of Rutland. If you haven't gotten the chance to check out our online archive yet, you definitely owe it to yourself to take a look. Right on our website, you can find the online archive, a digitized collection of fascinating treasure trove of documents pertaining to the Boston and Maine, the Maine Central, and other New England railroads as well. Inside, you'll find hundreds of fascinating documents, executive documents, financial documents, operational documents, abandonment files. We also have the entire run of the Society newsletter, a Boston and Maine freight car index, employee magazines from the Boston and Maine and the Maine Central, and so much more. There's literally hundreds of hours of documents that you can get lost in. You can find all of that right on our website, bmrrhs.org. And if you like what you see, consider making a donation to the Society or joining so you too can volunteer as part of the Archives Committee. Hi, and welcome to High Green, the official podcast of the Boston and Maine Railroad Historical Society. I'm online committee member Andrew Rydell, and tonight I'm joined by fellow online committee member Rick Kafori, and we're delighted to welcome our guest Robert Willoughby Jones to the podcast. Robert has written three books about the Boston and Maine, Three Colorful Decades of New England Railroading, City and Shore, and Forest, River, and Mountain. Robert, welcome to High Green, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, Robert, I guess I'll just sort of start at the beginning for me. Um, tell me what it was like growing up in Marblehead with the Marblehead branch, uh, anything you might remember of the trains in town. The, you, you talked a lot about the branch in your first volume, so just interested to hear more of your experiences with the trains in Marblehead. Well, of course, when we, we had <clears throat> two stints living in Marblehead, <clears throat> excuse me, my first four years, uh, we lived in Marblehead, and I would have seen the trains. And that is the time when one Saturday my dad took me downtown and we saw a steam engine sitting there poised to go off to Boston with a Saturday morning train. And the engineer was welcoming, and so I got hoisted up into the cab, and the engineer gave me a half an oatmeal cookie. And uh, probably at the time, the oatmeal cookie was just – this is exciting to me as being in the cab, but it was pretty exciting nonetheless. And I just remember it was a, a, a steamy black thing, you know, and you smelled the sulfur and the coal. And indeed, I remember that from all of my childhood in Marblehead, especially in the wintertime, how the town smelled of sulfurous coal. A part of that, of course, was the, the regular entrance of steam engines into Marblehead every day. And part of it was that people, many of them, heated their coal homes with coal at that time. But it was a particular feeling of Marblehead that I remember. And when I started, um, we moved to Topsfield when I was four. We moved back to Marblehead in 1954 when I was eight. And I began haunting the train station and just going down there in the afternoons after school, because uh, there would be four trains coming into town. And my father was usually on the last one. And so if I just wanted to hang out at the depot, I could see four trains coming and going. And as I think I have said, the, the first and the fourth went back to Boston while the second and third went over to Salem. But even before, uh, going down to the depot, when I was three years old, my parents got me into Tower School, uh, even before kindergarten. 
How they pulled that off, I'm not sure, but I went there for a year. And Tower School in Marblehead was adjacent on the Marblehead branch at West Shore Drive. And in the morning, we might see one of the commuter trains going into Marblehead from Salem to take people to Boston. But even more, uh, I remember, a track inspection car would trip off from time to time the crossing lights and bells. Uh, so I'm assuming that they were just testing for safety purposes, because that typically was not accompanied by a train. But the fact that the railroad was right there was very exciting. And uh, anytime anything happened, whether a train went by or the track car, all the kids ran to the window and had to see what was going on. So once we um, moved from Topsfield, where there were no trains, we stopped at my grandmother's house for the summer. As we got out of our house in Topsfield, our Marblehead house was not going to be available until September, right after school started. So I had a couple of months in Salem where I had seen trains before down in the yard by Canal Street. And I'd certainly seen trains at the crossings and the depots. And the very first thing I did, I snuck out of the house that first morning in Salem and made sure my grandmother and my mother were not paying attention to what I was doing. And I probably got down to the yard in 10 or 15 minutes. It wasn't that long a walk. Most of that yard is gone today. Um, it's hardly anything left, but back then there was a freight yard and a freight house. And actually there were, I, I think four running tracks if you hit the area right around where I guess people don't know it today, but there used to be a bridge to Castle Hill section of Salem. And right there was the freight house. And in addition to the two-track main line, there was a branch from Salem Station all the way down to a junction and went off to Marblehead. <clears throat> and that track was used every day for, uh, I think that's where they stored the two commuter trains that came over from Marblehead to spend the night. I don't believe they went as far as Salem Tunnel and onto the, uh, the roundhouse on the other side. And then, on the west side of the tracks, there was some kind of a running track that started way up in Pickman Park, which is about a mile south of Salem. And part of that siding is still there today, but it used to go much further to the south. And uh, one thing I remember about that location where the, the junction up there was, where that freight running track joined the main line, there was a home signal, and the home signal was to the right of the third track and it stood up on a mast and it had one of those blue lights on the right side. Now, if you've never seen that, the blue light indicated that the main signal was one track away from the main line. Um, I don't think there's anything like that there now. So it's a small detail. I did, chat my way around Salem Yard. And I, when I was in my teens, I talked my way onto a switcher that was going down the Marblehead branch. And we went as far as Gilbert and Co uh, sorry, New England Coke. And New England Coke was a factory making Coke. Uh, now, what is Coke? Coke is a type of charcoal. Do you know what Coke is? Yeah, I think it's like a byproduct of coal. Uh, Rick, are you familiar with it or? It's a uh, it's a fuel they use for um, the steel process. It's um it's like a, it has a very high carbon content. So it's like it's like a, it is like charcoal, but it's it's a bit different uh, than than charcoal. So what else would it be used for? Because we didn't have a steel plant around here. It's usually since it burns pretty hot, since it has a high carbon content, it's it's usually used for for melting metals like iron and ores and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it's literally used for 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 melting liquefied metals in that, in that use, yeah. So if there was any sort of machine shop or any kind of foundry around exactly, here, they would get mm -hmm. coke from them, right? Yeah, a foundry, yep, for sure. Well, of course, that 
that was one important source of revenue on the Marblehead branch. Now you understand the Marblehead branch was created right around 1843. And what we call the Swampscott branch, which went from Marblehead to Swampscott on its way to Boston, they chose that name because there already was a Marblehead branch, but they both started in Marblehead and took you trains to those respective places. So I, uh, I was pretty chatty in those days and I would ask questions. I was very uninhibited and I got to know the, the yard crew at the Salem freight house. And uh, one day and riding my bike over to Salem, I decided that I would go up again into Salem Tower. And I'd been up to Salem Tower as a Cub Scout. We had a, our troop went over there one day and um, the two Scout Masters, one of whom was my mother uh, and Mrs. Haley, they had done some groundwork and paved the way so the towerman knew we were coming. But I do remember how he barked at us kids not to touch anything because, you know, there would have been 20 of us and we could have easily made a mess of things if we'd been poking and touching switches. But Salem Tower was, was really very nice up there. It, you had a view of what I suppose is the Danvers River. No, North River. It's the North River, sorry. And uh, it's like an inlet. It comes, the water comes under Beverly Drawbridge. And then as it heads straight west, that's the Danvers River. But as it comes toward Salem, it's the North River. And it's a pretty location. And the roundhouse was there in those days. And probably still existing at that time, although I didn't notice it was that you could come through Salem Tunnel. And if you headed off to the slightly to the Northwest, you'd be going to Beverly. And if you headed more West, you'd be going to Peabody. And that switch was actually uh, right there at the edge of the tunnel. But there was a third possibility and you could take an engine right straight ahead between those two stubs and go right onto the turntable and from there right into the roundhouse. But all of that was uh, eliminated in the Salem Tunnel Project of 1956. Now earlier, the Salem Tunnel had been modified. Uh, of course, it was original from roughly 1840 when the Eastern Railroad was built through and they went under that hill in Salem. But on the north side of the tunnel, up until about 1950, uh, there was a grade crossing there, and it was had become quite a bottleneck for traffic. And in the 1950 construction, that was all eliminated, and the roads lifted up above that. But the 1956 project put the tunnel under a great deal more of Salem, more under the business district. And that's when they tore down the gigantic uh, granite depot dating from 1847. That was really uh, a very special building. Big, dark granite, uh, wonderfully romantic. It just looked like a giant Norman castle right there in the middle of Salem. Uh, I went there as a young kid many, many times with my grandparents uh, who took me into Boston now and again. And uh, I, I was rereading part of the book last night and was reminded of how when you were in those dark red steel coaches, so they'd been around a while. They were by no means new. A lot of them came secondhand to the Boston and Maine in the late 40s and early 50s when the railroad was trying to re replace wooden coaches. But the seats were permeated with train smells. They were a little bit moldy and you could smell steam and you could smell sulfur. And it was an unbelievable odor. And you, you never smelled it anywhere else. And you always knew you were in a train car. But it was magical. You know, you didn't, we didn't know streamlined cars in those days or 
We certainly didn't have any bud cars right then. Uh, but soon enough, that's all we had. And you probably read where I found, eventually I found bud cars to be kind of boring because that's all you would see on the B&M. And when my friend Lincoln and I would go to Boston, we were thrilled to go to South Station and see all kinds of New Haven heavyweight equipment and even a little bit of Pensy stuff because the senator would come in every day. Uh, you know the senator was Boston, Washington, right? Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard of the senator. Yes. No, I mean this is uh, this is uh, great. Just hearing the you know because obviously people in our the younger generation we we will never smell the smell that you'll never forget, which is pretty pretty cool. You know, I'm sure if you smelled that smell right now, you'd detect it in a moment. You'd immediately know what it is because, like you said, it was unmistakable. I think if I smelled it now, I I would know that I had crossed over into train heaven. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> and ac actually, uh, one one sort of item in your books, especially the trip you took with your uh, family up to, I think it was like a jelly factory up near the Potter Place train station. That photo you took a Potter Place in um, three colorful decades of New England railroading. That's always been a favorite of mine because that was a train station I used to see as a kid all the time when my family and I would take drives around the Newfound Lake area, would often drive down Route 4, down by Danbury, et cetera. And I'd always see the Potter Place Station. And obviously this was like the early 90s, so the Northern was long abandoned. But then when I saw your photo from, I think it was like 1960 or 61 or something, just seeing, looking down the active train tracks in that area, you know, that really ignited a lot of images in my mind of what once was, so. I always found that particular narrative of yours very interesting. We were driving, I guess we were driving south on Route 4, because I think I remember it was the last frame of film that I had on the camera. And uh, my dad, most of the time, was fairly patient with having to stop for train pictures. I also knew that his patience was limited, and so I didn't push it. If he was in a bad mood, I might not even ask, but we were all having a good time that day and we could all see the station. So it wasn't far afield as you passed it on Route 4 and the light was fading and it was just a really magical moment. We have the late afternoon light and the station is a beautiful station. It has lovely lines. And, you know, today it's as in just nice condition, if not better than it was at that time. I don't know how that has happened, but somebody has kept it up and made it nice. So I got that last picture, and as I explained in the book, uh, there wasn't quite enough film, so the left side of the station got cut off. But I think if I hadn't told anybody that, nobody would know. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, n I never would have noticed. I mean, like I said, uh, cut off or not cut off, that photo has always been a favorite of mine. Just like I said, it just, you know, it's just the empty track stretching off into the distance. It just, it just makes you wonder like what's down the track, what's around that corner. And, you know, for somebody who will never see a train on in that corridor, most likely, um, for me, at least, that was really cool to sort of put that piece together from something that I had seen in a much different uh, context. I am. I think it's just a terrible shame that the Northern is gone. And it, it would be very, very difficult to put it back. And even if you did, it's through such rural country, you would have a lot of grade crossings. Mm -hmm. So even though I think that we could do pretty well with a Boston Montreal train. I just wonder if that is a realistic thought for even 50 years down the road in the future because of the grade crossings. And I think the speed limit at that time was perhaps 40, 45 miles an hour. So it's not fast. Yeah, one thing, even as a child, I noticed along Route 4, a lot of places, the Northern would literally cross people's driveways, like if their house was set back a little further from the road, or if it was like a rural farm, oftentimes the, 
you'd have Route 4, then you'd immediately cross the northern while entering the driveway to some of these farms or homes. And as a kid, I always, I mean, obviously I was like, oh, that must be awesome if you used to, you know, have trains running right through your front yard every day, but, you know, not realizing the complexity and logistics that would be to someday restore it. But I guess um, sticking with the Northern for a second, uh, Robert, you took a little uh, road trip with a few of your uh, buddies in high school. Um, I remember reading about you went up the Northern and you rode your bikes down to Steamtown. It was a really wonderful trip. I don't remember now whose idea it was to start with, but um, Lincoln Soul, who just died a month or two ago, was my best friend in high school. And our mutual friend, Bob Meckley, went, we all three went, and Ruth Soul drove us into North Station in the family station wagon. And uh, at that time, you could drive your car right into the alley next to North Station and not be hurried or hassled. There was no pressure to move your car out. And we unloaded the bikes right there and just walked around the corner to the platform. And I was quite surprised that there were two bud cars that day. I had imagined that the White River Junction business was down to one car. So we we put the bikes in the baggage part of the second car, um, which was an our or it may have been in the first car, but the baggage section was in the middle of the train in any case. And um, whichever it was, you can see it pictures in the book. But the train crew let us keep the door open and because we had said was it all right if we take pictures through the door and they said yes just don't fall out and they were they were fine with our riding on the rear platform and and so my memory i don't remember going through the train but people must have noticed us on the train thinking who are those annoying boys who keep going back and forth through the car (laughs) to get to the back platform or to get to the baggage compartment but we had a nice trip up there. It, it was a very pretty ride once we got north of Concord. It's pretty industrial when you, you go throughout the Boston corridor and you see lots of old factories along the way, still there today, many of them made for new use, as you know. But once you get up into New Hampshire, it becomes extremely pretty and beautiful. And the ride going up there was a pretty much a sunny day. It was very, very pretty. And once we got to Westboro, the, the, the railroad name is Westboro, New Hampshire, but the town is Lebanon, if I, I believe that's correct. Mm-hmm. We saw Canadian Pacific diesels there in the roundhouse, uh, which would make sense because there was CP equipment coming down that far. And the uh, conductor, we stopped the train, the conductor went over to the phone box and called someone, maybe the dispatcher in Greenfield, for us to get permission to cross the bridge and go into the the active train area at White River Junction. Now, I had been there once before, maybe, it's hard to remember now, maybe twice before, but I'm not sure that I had experienced the four trains from uh, one from Boston going to Montreal and the other one going the other way. And then the Montreal, Springfield, New York trains and all four of them met at the same time. And one of the oddest things that I've seen in terms of operations was the northbound train and the southbound train. This is between Montreal and New York. So they're going down the Con River. Once those trains got into White River Junction, the engines were taken off and a switch crew came by with a switcher and moved one of the trains onto the same track as the other and backed up that train so that there were just two or three feet between the two trains. So if you look at some pictures in various books about the B&M, sometimes you will see a very long train sitting there, but it's in fact two trains. And I've never understood the reason why they did this. 
they, they would come in separately, they'd arrive on different tracks, but in the 20 or 25 minute layover, they would be backed up. Now, maybe it's just as simple as it was more convenient to have them on a closer track than one of them, one track over. Mm -hmm. It was less distance for passengers to walk from the station. But there must be some reason, and I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But it was fascinating to me that even in those late days, when there wasn't much business at all, there was that that was all that was left of White River Junction passenger-wise, was the afternoon rush. And then in the early morning hours, the Washingtonian and the Montrealer went through. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember now if they met at White River Junction. I just don't remember. I, I suppose they could have accidentally done so if they weren't scheduled to. But there wasn't much action at White River Junction in those days, but there were still switchers. And I suppose they would have been used in the freight yard just as easily. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that was the justification for them. But once we got to White River Junction, we watched the meeting of all the trains and the departure of the trains. And then when things calmed down, we got on the bikes mm -hmm. and we headed south. And it was a lovely, lovely, beautiful afternoon, great weather. And we, we, I think we rode for an hour and a half before we were getting hungry. And then we came to this amazing little tiny country store and the light was going fast. And I said in the book, and I emphasize, I, it was like going back in time to the 1920s. We just seemed to pass through a time window and go into a much quieter era with no noise and no people. Mm -hmm. And we bought sandwiches at the store and we ate outside on the bikes. And it was a bare light bulb and mosquitoes and bugs flying around. And <laughs> it was so upper New England, quiet. And then we headed back down to uh, Claremont Junction and went off in the woods and camped for the night, someplace near Claremont Junction. We could hear the Montrealer in the middle of the night and both directions whistling. And as much as we wanted to get up and run down the tracks, we were tired and thought, oh, hell, you know, we won't be able to take pictures anyway. We won't see much of anything. So um, waited until morning. Then we got up and made our way down to the Monadnock Steam Town in Northern, which was such an interesting operation. Wooden cars. Oh, yeah. And maybe X, B, and M coaches, maybe? They were, yep. Did you say yes or no? Yes, they, they were. <clears throat> um, quite a few of them were uh, from the work train equipment, had been salvaged, bought at, uh, at low prices by Blount from the B&M directly. Yeah. <clears throat> Poor Mr. Blount, if only he had remembered to refuel his plane. Mm, yeah. Now, I have a theory about McGinnis logos, and this is digressing a bit, but I would like I'd like this to be on the record. We're all familiar with the famous B and M logo that I think the blue and black and white logo that was designed by Herbert Matter of Florence Knoll Associates. You know who Florence Knoll was, right? Florence Knoll was the designer lady who was a friend of Lucille McGinnis. Okay. Mm. And when McGinnis was at the New Haven and they undertook a design program to rebrand the New Haven, which wound up being the N over the H in vermilion and black, uh, Mrs. McGinnis was a friend of Florence Knoll. That may be how Knoll and Associates got to be chosen to do the redesign of the New Haven. I don't know that, but I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. But they certainly were friends. And we do know the story of how Pat and Mrs. McGinnis went out to the factory to see the New Haven EP5s coming out in the new paint. One of them was painted vermilion black and white, and the other one was painted chrome yellow black and white. And Mrs. McGinnis that day had on a vermilion scarf 
And so it's no surprise that she chose the Vermilion scheme for the New Haven and thus all future New Haven for the next several years was painted orange, black and white. I say orange, it was more like Vermilion. It was a red orange Mm -hmm. and not yellow. And you know that, did you guys know that? I had not heard that, no. Yeah, well, no, nah, me neither. Rapido, the toy train maker, mm-hmm. has just, mm-hmm. they are just now coming out with a New Haven EP5 in several paint schemes. Black for Penn Central and orange and black and white for New Haven, but they're also bringing out a copy in yellow. So if you want to get a yellow <laughs> New Haven wow. EP5, it only lasted one day in that paint scheme. Yeah. It, it was put back into the factory and repainted immediately. Yeah. But there exist one or two color pictures taken by, I think his name was, uh, I can't remember. He was the New Haven photographer. Okay. I think his last name was Gunn. Hmm. In any case, after 18 months, McGinnis is forced out of the New Haven. And by that time, his group, his finance group had already bought control in the proxy fight of the Boston and Maine. And McGinnis had hoped to be president of both railroads. But on the day that he was turned down by the ICC, who said, uh, there's no way that you're going to be president of both railroads, and I'm omitting the adjectives. (laughs) He Resigned from the New Haven board in the morning, and that afternoon he showed up at 150 Causeway Street to assume the presidency of the Boston and Maine. Now, this happened in January 1956, but since the prior April or May, they had controlled the railroad. Mm -hmm. And so there was an acting president of the Boston and Maine from the prior spring. Um, I may think of his name in a minute, but they already controlled it. At some point, they decided to have a rebranding for the Boston and Maine, and the natural choice was Herbert Matter of Nolan Associates. And he was duly hired, and the logo we know today came up in that process. But you may also be familiar with alternate B and M logos in blue and black that made it onto F units. Like in particular, I think F3s and F2s. Do you, you recall seeing these alternate schemes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think even in uh, even in your book, I believe there's a picture or two of uh, yes, some of them. Yes, exactly the scheme I'm talking about, which is truly the most awkward, horrible, dumb, <laughs> ill-proportioned yeah. logo ever to come down the pike out of mm-hmm. anybody's stable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I do not believe for a moment that Herbert Matter designed that. Mm -mm. But when he was designing the New Haven logo, he went through maybe a hundred sketches for possibilities. And you can find these online. There's a wonderful little source online where you can see dozens and dozens of Herbert Matter sketches for the New Haven logo, all of which show the ingenuity of a skilled designer. Mm -hmm. Well, There's a very famous photograph that is in Matt Fratazio's book on McGinnis and the New Haven, where he shows there are maybe four possible B&M logos on a lobby display. Mm -hmm. The only good logo there is the one that we know was the final logo. And what I think happened is I think Mrs. McGinnis said, Pat, you paid Herbert Matter all that money to do that NH logo. She says, I could have done that. <laughs> Why don't you let me give it a try? So I think those other terrible logos are the work of Lucille McGinnis. And Pat, having to live in this marriage, said, okay, honey, we'll try them out on a couple of diesels and see what happens. <laughs> Knowing full well that he would never use them or... Uh, I would love to have recordings from those dining room conversations <laughs> or wherever they took place. But right. anyway, that's my theory about that. No kidding. That could wow. be. Yeah. <laughs> there was all kinds of interesting uh, 
stuff going on. I know there were a number of box cars that were painted in various, you know, black with with a blue logo rather than you know the blue with the uh, the black and and the logo we're used to. A lot of them I don't think ever saw revenue service, but there was even um, a sketch that that came out a few years ago of a of a Russell snowplow in um, McGinnis paint, and uh, there was actually a Minuteman logo on there instead of the B and M cross logo that we're used to. So all kinds of strange variations, you know, I think we have some of those in the archives as well, but uh, it's, it's interesting to see what, what could have been and then what probably shouldn't have been as well. <laughs> yeah. I think most of those box cars that you're discussing were prototypes and were mm-hmm. in service. They, there were black box cars and there were blue box cars and the logo did have some variations. I, I'm quite surprised that the logo that you would see on the Bud cars is also in two versions. Uh, my preferred version that I think is aesthetically the best happens when the M is further down and squeezed in. Yes, I you agree. Can, mm-hmm. You can see, uh, for example, the, the logo that they're using in Bedford on one end of their preserved Bud car, they chose the other of the two logos where the M is a little bigger this way. Mm-hmm. But they were both prototypical. They were indeed both used on the B and M. I don't know whether it's a Herbert Matter variation or something that happened in B and M design. I have no way of knowing. But they were used. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one much more extensively. Uh, of course, then there's the Talgo train. The Talgo train's design was not by Herbert Matter. The colors on the Talgo train were designed by Brewer. Is it Michel Brewer? I can't remember. But Brewer, who also designed some of the stuff for the New Haven and was under, under contract to uh, Noel Associates, he did the work on the Telco. So I guess uh, while we're on the subject of logos and uh, photographs and images, um, Robert, one of the things that uh, we were talking about um, regarding your books is uh, the Richard Sanborn photos that complement your photos within the books. Um, he, he takes uh, such beautiful photos. We were uh, just kind of wondering like how, what your uh, connection was with Richard Sanborn and how, um, just how like his photos, you know, I mean, like I said, they're just beautiful images in your books. And we were just wondering like what the story was behind those. Richard Sanborn was an extremely generous hearted man who wanted to help I contacted him by letter saying that I had seen some of his material and would he be willing to lend me things for the book? And he immediately said yes. And I arranged to meet him at his family home. I don't remember quite where it was. It was north of here. But I met his mom and dad Mm -hmm. and I think a sibling or two and they all lived together. And at that time, he was the headmaster of a boys' school. That was his vocation. And his uh, longtime hobby had been photographing the railroad. And he had a tremendous amount of material. Now, I think in the last year, a lot of his material has shown up on eBay and is for sale or was for sale. It has, yeah. Um, he passed away. I don't know how recently, but within five or 10 years, he died fairly young. And I only met him that one time. Um, The family, I think we all had lunch. They were extremely welcoming. And I was just amazed at the quality and the quantity of what he had. Um, He was able to fill in all sorts of places in the book where I didn't have what I needed. Uh, I can remember one photograph in particular of a train, a freight train on the line that runs east from Portsmouth Mm -hmm. being a place where I just didn't have any photography at all. Mm -hmm. I was very, very glad to get it. I would, I wish I could say that we became great friends. Um, I, at the time, was living in California, and so my contacts were limited. But I have very fond memories of him as a person. He was a a really great person. 
he uh, he was he was a fascinating person. I've I've come to learn quite a bit about him uh, because he was really the really the only designated photographer for the Portsmouth branch, which was where I grew up. I grew up in Raymond, New Hampshire, and um, I, I, I feel like that's probably the line that you you mentioned there, uh, yes. heading east west there. And uh, he, I believe it was Epping that he was he lived in, um, and he would go out and take just unbelievable photographs on on those branches, those seldom photographed branches. Really, I mean, nobody else was out there taking pictures of you know these backwater, the Fremont branch as well, down to Fremont, um, and uh, yeah, he had quite extensive coverage of of all that. But he also. Um, what's come out in some of his slides that uh, we've seen, unfortunately, like you said, kind of parceled out and, and split up on eBay there. Um, he wrote a lot of the final passenger trains um, in and out of Portland and Portsmouth and places like that. So he shows up on in January of 1965 all over the system in White River Junction as well. Um, and it's really neat to see that kind of photography where somebody was paying that close attention to the end of rail service in these places and then going out and getting such fantastic color photography. I think that that's an excellent point. Uh, I was, we were so lucky to have that wonderful photograph at Portsmouth on the last day of service, mm -hmm. which oh, yeah. showed, showed off um, the depot rather well. It is behind the bud car, but you can see the lines of the depot. And it's so ironic that service ended there so soon. I mean, the depot was renovated in the very early 50s mm -hmm. and they, they made it quite something. And, and very shortly after they did all that work, they discontinued the through trains to Portland via Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. I think the last one was 1951 or 52. And then the service was gone by 1965, right? Isn't that the end? Yeah, January yeah. 1st or 2nd. Yeah, I think it was like right January 3rd or something. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right around then. But mm -hmm. Interestingly, in the book, I believe I said that that was the penultimate train leaving and that the final train would have been too late for photography because of the light. Mm -hmm. And I have yeah. been disproven. I just saw the other day an Alan McMillan photograph that he took of the last Bud car heading south. Mm -hmm. Now it's much darker, but there's still light. And I, it was, I, I was able to collaborate with a few people and, and we've been able to acquire about 2000 of St. Richard's slides, uh, color slides, me and about four other people. And some of those are that last trip leaving Portsmouth. So I, I will have to send you some copies of those. <laughs> Oh, that's fascinating. I um, he was holding out on me then. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of things um, shots that I recognize. As a matter of fact, quite a few of them are slides that I that are in the books, which is funny because I remember seeing those as a kid, very little kid, saying, "Holy cow, there's a train in Fremont, New Hampshire," and then you know, ten years later, coming to find those images for yes, there's a lot of uh, alternate images to the the shots in the books, which is interesting. Um, it really makes you think about these photographers, you know, going out and taking these pictures. And that's every time I see a picture in a book or anywhere else, it always leads me to say they must have taken other shots that day. And then that's a mission to go find those other shots. True enough. True enough. Uh, I was at Skip Clark's house when I first started the process. After I decided to write the book and was contacting all these photographers. Skip Clark was at the top of my list. This is Norton D. Clark I'm talking about. Right. He lived in Newton and he was also very welcoming. And I went to his house to meet him and his wife. And I think they had the largest cat in the world. This cat was as large as a watermelon. And <laughs> I don't know how the poor thing walked around. It looked like it was going the legs were going to come out from under it, but he had all this fascinating material. And one of the slides that he had was by Leon Onifre. Mm -hmm. And it was a shot at North Station about 1948 of all steam engines, no diesels. The bridge project was years in the future, so there was no expressway going over North Station. It was 
North Station as God had intended. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting elements in the photograph was there was a, a railway express wagon placed, was in the picture, and that made the composition really sing. Mm -hmm. This just was beautifully done. Now, it was a duplicate slide. And I said to Skip, I said, you know, I don't really want to use duplicates if I can help it. Mm -hmm. And my reasoning is they're often really inferior sharpness-wise. Right. And he said, well, he said, you'll never get anywhere getting any slides out of Onofre. He said, he's dead and his family is not cooperative and they won't help you. And I wondered to myself, I thought, well, maybe they weren't approached properly in a nice way. Mm -hmm. you, you never know. And my motto in life is none but the brave deserve the fair. <laughs> and so I thought it was worth contacting the daughter. Mm -hmm. So I found out somehow how to contact Annette Onofre. And she was also extremely helpful. And I got invited to their house. And uh, the slides were very disorganized. They were just in great big boxes, all thrown in boxes. Mm -hmm. But before I got there, I had I'd been looking specifically for that slide. And she found something that must have been taken a minute before or a minute after without the railway express wagon, but still a really, really great picture of steam. And that's in the book. Mm -hmm. That's that's I think one of the first pictures in the North Station section. And that slide and two others I had offered, I said, if you can find these three slides, I will pay you very well. Now, when you're doing a book like this, you basically don't, you can't afford to pay people. Mm -hmm. But there have to be exceptions here and there. If you really want something, and uh, Another example was Rodney Peterson, but I'll come back to him. And so Annette, for the money that I offered, went and found those three slides. And the deal was that I would own them. I was buying them from her. And so of the dozens and dozens and dozens of slides that I still have from that collection, I actually own those three. And as for the determination of where those slides are to go, um, soon, because I'm getting older, we need, to, we need to decide, she and I, whether they will be donated or sold or what's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess I, what I wanted to go back and summarize there is that you're not going to get something unless you ask. And if you ask in a nice way and are courteous and handle it the way the people would like to handle it, you will do much better. So I was extremely fortunate to get my hands on the Onofre collection, because if you remember from the captions, there's a tremendous amount of steam material and stuff that no one else had. Now, going back to Skip Clark, Skip was very helpful. And uh, that first night that I met him was at his house his really sweet, lovely wife, Susan, was there. Mm -hmm. At the end of the evening, I had amassed this pile of maybe 20, 40, 60 slides, more like 60. The way I had set up the meeting and what I had told everybody is that I wanted to borrow whatever it was I liked and take the stuff back to Los Angeles and make final decisions there. Well, Skip kind of got cold feet that night, and he looked at me, and he looked at this pile of slides, and he said, well, you weren't planning to walk out of those here tonight, were you? <laughs> and I said, well, yes, actually, I was. <laughs> but he, I could tell that he was concerned, so I said, look, I don't have to take them tonight. I, I've made a list of what you have, and I said, uh, I'm happy to wait until I'm further along in the process and contact you then if you think you're still interested. He said, well, he said, yes, I'll help you. I'm just a little leery about giving everything to you tonight. I said, that's no problem. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was working with Don Hills, who was a dispatcher on the B&M and who also provided dozens of first-rate slides, meaning 
great color saturation, sharp, mm -hmm. great material. He had wonderful things. Uh, Don, <clears throat> Don became, I think, concerned in the middle of the process that I had had slides for several months. And I think from his perspective, nothing seemed to be happening. So he called me one day very concerned and said, would I mind sending everything back because he wanted to have the material for slideshows? And I said, of course, of course you can. And I sent it back immediately. And we had the understanding that later, when I knew possibly more, I would re-ask. Now, it was a clumsy process, but you have to respect the owner's wishes and it also told me that I had possibly annoyed somebody with the delay and you don't want that to happen either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doing a book is tricky. It's, it's a long, arduous process and mm -hmm. the personal element is just as important as anything else. Yeah. Cause as you're saying here, it sounds like a large part of it was the relationship building, the people you met, the families of the photographers. Uh, it sounds like you built a lot of relationships through the book project. I tried to the first summer I went out on a collecting jaunt from Los Angeles and I came back to new England and my base of operations was my parents home. Uh, this would be my father and my stepmother in Marblehead. And I would take some day trips, but I also had some overnight trips because I had to go further up into New Hampshire and Maine and Vermont and so forth. That first trip, I had a list of, oh, this was a two week venture. And some of those days I saw two and three people each day. Mm. Some of it was really quite busy and a lot of tearing around, but it was very exciting at the same time. And also on that trip, I managed to get in a couple of cab rides, which we always love. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I was just gonna ask uh, Robert, so you lived in California for some time. What was it like coming back to New England in you know the late 1980s, early 90s, uh, just sort of just seeing a much different Boston and Maine railroad than from what you recalled from your childhood and teenage years? Uh, what was that kind of like when you returned? My first inkling was through the bulletin. And I would, I became a subscriber to the bulletin. And I remember having a conversation with Richard Sims one day, who was a friend from when I had been in high school. I said, it seemed to me that there was an awful lot of the B&M that was gone that I had known. He said, oh, it's all gone. He said, it's nothing but a freight main line between Portland, Maine and Mechanicville, New York. He said, virtually all the branch lines are gone, which was quite upsetting to me. And one reason why in my books, the photography stops at a certain point is that I felt that the Boston and Maine became gritty looking at a certain point. And I didn't like that look in photographs. And so it goes in, the books go into the McGinnis era up to a certain point, but once the railroad began to fall apart and nothing was repainted, that was hard to see. You know, to answer your question, coming back, I, I had visited over the years, but I hadn't really focused on trains that much until I got interested again. And then coming back and re-photographing, starting photography again of trains, uh, some of it was rather fascinating. I was in Salem one day and what's coming through pulling bud cars, but a Detroit Jeep painted orange and silver. That was pretty unusual, you know, from the, the commuter agency that called SEMTA, Southeast Michigan Transportation Authority, I assume. But that, if you remember seeing that Jeep that was orange and silver, that was around. And then one day I was at the mouth of Salem Tunnel on the south end 
and a commuter train comes through, I think mud cars being pulled by a Burlington Northern green and white Jeep. And you saw kind of a lot of unusual equipment on the railroad, which was fun. But the stuff was junky and things weren't being maintained very well. And North Station was kind of hideous and falling apart. Yeah, I remember uh, going there once or twice when I was young. And yeah, the North Station that I remember as a boy, I mean, it's not as uh, eclectic now as it used to be, but I'll tell you, it's it's a lot cleaner these days than it used to be from what I remember, you know, early 90s, late 80s. Yes, yeah, so I think North Station is nice and clean now. It's a shame that the people who own Boston Garden convinced Massachusetts and or the MBTA that they should carve out one car length's worth of track to make the new waiting area as nice as it is. And of course we didn't even have that. We had nothing for a long time. We had the most crowded hallway in the world, if you remember, because the footprint of the old North station, which had we were we the public were all told that a new north station in some form would be built there but that has not happened once the the hot dog people in the garden ed levey calls them the hot dog people because he says that they're more interested in hot dogs than they are in sports but <laughs> they're successful they make money you can't you can't fault them for that once those people gain sway over the real estate by creating that new waiting room, any plans for a new North Station on that old footprint went away. And it's basically now all finished and open. And you will you have seen certainly that there's no station there. We just have the waiting room that was built over track space. So we have one car's length less capacity at North Station mm -hmm. than we used to. And that's not a good thing. No. But we move on nonetheless. And uh, I'm hoping that we will indeed get tracks 11 and 12, which, as you must know, there are bays for built there already. And at the moment, we still have the parking area at the former Spalding Hospital that's in the way of accessing those tracks. And we have some kind of plan for new drawbridges. And I've been told that the two new drawbridges will hold I, I guess the, the latest plan that I heard, I have not seen this in print anywhere, but they want to construct one new drawbridge first of two tracks, put it into service, then take out one old drawbridge, and that would leave them again with four tracks. And once that other one is out, they would build yet a new one. And when they're done, there will be three two-track drawbridges. Hmm. That's what I would like to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I forget where this was. It, I definitely have heard something along those lines that they want to increase the bridge capacity. I, I love how like they built that new uh, park and footbridge over, I think it's called the North Point Park, but you can even see the old bridge piers from the two, I don't know, I don't know if it was like 1960 or something that the other two were taken out, but uh, you can still see all the piers from the two drawbridges that are long gone. The two, the draw, the spans three and four that were taken out were still in position in 1961. And for quite a few months, they were in vertical position. And I have a black and white picture that I've never even shown anybody taken from some distance away in the yard looking toward North Station where you can see those two bridges sticking up in the air. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, they were taken out. But that's 1961, they were still there. Mm -hmm. And for my money, for, for future, I mean, what are we going to do in 100 years when we really need station capacity there? Right. Uh, we, we, yeah. the, the new construction has compromised the space at the station end. We have a brand new building sitting to the west of the 12 tracks that's kind of prohibiting any any station to be there. You know, you still have the parking lot that's not been 
used, but that would mean the Spalding building would have to come down. Mm -hmm. And who knows what real estate interests will get in the way of that in the meantime. Mm -hmm. But I mean, surely in 50 or 100 years, we're going to need that full station capacity, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that in 50 or 100 years, you might be able to board a train there and once again go to New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, Montreal, uh, Albany, who knows? Yeah. Well, we all would like there to see cross Boston trains in a new tunnel. Mm -hmm. And that's been on again, off again for the last 30 years, as you know. Right. Yeah. Who, I, I just don't know where that will go. Mm -hmm. It's going to be really expensive. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, I guess uh, w one thing I always did like reading about, I guess this is because I love exploring the abandoned right of ways myself, but I, I love that little anecdote you told about exploring the marsh um, in Essex and finding the remains of the old roadbed heading over to what was once the Conomo train station, which still stands as a house. Uh, every time uh, a few years ago, my wife and I were at Woodman's one night and I pointed out in the marsh and I was like, yeah, see those trees out there? That used to be a railroad that ran through the marsh out there. And, you know, just one of those things, it was always a, uh, Interesting little story I always thought you told. Now, next time you go up there, keep driving past Woodman's and try uh, E.T. Farnham. That's another mile up the road on the left. It's much better. Okay. Oh, yeah. I've, I've eaten there as well. Uh, no no abandoned railroads visible from that one. No. But, uh, yes, I do. I do enjoy their clams, though. I agree. <laughs> so um, the, 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 the wonderful thing about that roadbed that used to be out there, and much of it has eroded, but there used to be pieces of the bridge out there, and there used to be uh, pilings in the water because there's a channel in there or some sort of stream. I noticed most of that is gone. I was looking at it from the Woodman's parking lot a few months ago, and I don't see any of that anymore. But that, that stuff was still up there in the 1960s. Mm -hmm which would make sense that that was still 40 years ago and that would have been only not even well it wasn't even 20 years after the Essex branch closed it seemed like a long time at the time but it was really second world war Essex was a very very pretty branch and uh still a lovely place mm -hmm. one thing i um uh... I really enjoyed about your books, uh, Robert, was, you know, when I was younger, the BNM is such a large, complex, and I think at times too large system um, for its own good, considering it was, you know, built of so many predecessor lines. But the thing I really enjoyed about the books was being able to be exposed to different parts of the BNM that I was not familiar with growing up in central New Hampshire, um, southern central New Hampshire. And over the years, that's kind of become something that I've really enjoyed is really learning about different parts of the B&M. Uh, recently, I've been getting a lot into um, the air branch lines, the Hollis branch, um, those types of things. So what was what were some of the locations, I assume, growing up on the east eastern part of Massachusetts? I'm sure you, you gained some insight into different parts of the B&M that you didn't have a lot of exposure to. Uh, what were some of the areas that you found fascinating to research that you hadn't uh, previously? Well, trying to figure out the railroad history right in this area was daunting because mm -hmm. there were so many railroad companies that started out here and got absorbed into the B&M. There was an awful lot of trackage around here. You might remember in the first book, Three Colorful Decades, there's a little map of the Danvers-Salem area, mm -hmm. which shows all the trackage around here. And tracks went everywhere. And I suppose there was a time in the late 1800s when there was at least a daily or two daily trains probably never patronized a whole lot because some of those lines were the first to go. Probably over time, but there one line, for example, between Salem and Melrose not Rolls, Wakefield, Salem and Wakefield. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Wakefield the, Junction. The, yeah. the, the southernmost of those east-west lines disappeared about 1926. Mm -hmm. And you could still get there 
if you went a little further north to Danvers and then went over a bit, you could still make your way to Wakefield. And of course, there was still train service right up until 1959. Um, as you know, Danvers was accessible by two different commuter routes to Boston. An awful lot of commuter service to Danvers, considering how small a place it was. But the ones from Wakefield Junction were remnants of the old Boston Newburyport service inland. Lincoln and I to um, Wilmington, Andover, around up there one day on our, his family was staying in a trailer mm -hmm. up there somewhere. And their dad had told me to ride up and join them. So I went up for several days and Lincoln and I took our bikes from there and went over to and North Andover and Wilton Junction, which would have been much too far to go on the bikes on a one day trip unless you wanted to kill yourself. Um, but I got a feeling for that part of the B&M that I never had before. And <clears throat> it's amazing how much literature is available today that's so helpful, like uh, Ronald Dale Carr's books on Southern and Northern New England and the branch lines that were lost. His books are so comprehensive. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. use those in my research and trying to figure out what was where. I keep uh, one, uh, his Lost Railroads book, I keep a copy in my house and a copy in the car because, I mean, just if, I feel like everywhere you go in New England, you see something, you're like, wait, what line is that? Or what, I mean, <laughs> right. his, yeah, it's, it's, it's always good to, for, for people in our hobby, it's always good to have copies of his books close at hand. Well, it's true. And there are lots of times when I'm out in New England, I, for, I was visiting a friend a year and a half ago up not too far from, um, it's on the, what is the thing? It's uh, on the Western Division, East Kingston, New Hampshire. Do you know where that station is? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Looks like the old Colonial House, I think. Yes, exactly right. And he's still in very good shape. But east of there, a friend of mine was showing me around his house, and he said, there's a railroad embankment right over there. And of course, I could not figure out what it was. In, in the end, I determined it was part of the old Worcester, Nashua, and Portland. Mm -hmm. wow. But if I'd had that book with me, I could have immediately identified it. But I really, it's hard to keep track of all that stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's funny because uh, a minute ago we were talking about Danvers, uh, the Danvers PBD area. And even now, like a lot of those lines are being converted into rail trails. And I'm still like, you know, I live just down the street from a lot of these towns and I, you know, like I've been uh, going to a lot of them to take walks. I'll take my uh, son there in the stroller and stuff. And even I'm still wondering if there are sections of these roadbeds that I haven't hit just because there are so many of them. It's uh, I got to like start marking down on a map the sections I've hit and the sections I haven't because there are just so many lines that are now being repurposed. And Well, also, uh about three years ago, I was reading the MBTA long-term plan that I found online. I believe it's been revised since then. But there was, as late as three years ago, several discussions about how they might extend commuter service northwest from Salem on the Peabody branch. And the question was, or the options were, should we stop short of where the Peabody station was to avoid tying up Peabody Square again with trains, or to move on to the Liberty Street Mall. Is it Liberty Street? Uh, Liberty. Li yeah, Liberty Tree Mall, I think. Liberty Tree Mall. Um, they, the, one of the options was to terminate the trains there where there's quite a bit of real estate available, and that would give you direct commuter access to 128. Of course, the Gloucester branch gets excellent service already. So I'm assuming that the allure for that service with respect to 128 serving it would be for people who live south of West Gloucester. Mm -hmm. Because once you leave West Gloucester, um, the towns on the line are Manchester, Beverly Farms, Montserrat, 
Pride's Crossing. But more inland, you, you would have, and 128 could indeed provide access to a very big commuter hub at Liberty Tree Mall. But I haven't seen any discussion of that in the last three or four years. But it's still not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Because between the eastern and western routes in the old parlance, there's still a big territory in there, Topsfield area, say, that has no direct rail service and has pretty big population. Yeah, definitely. Especially Peabody and Danvers. I mean, I feel like every time I drive through there, I'm always thinking, wow, it's, it's amazing. Had these, uh, had they known the population increases these towns would experience, would the train still be here if they had the foresight to think about that back when things were abandoned? Well, they didn't. McGinnis on the B&M tried valiantly to get the state of Massachusetts interested in taking over the commuter service, but nobody was listening to him. And unfortunately, his reputation as a wheeler dealer was that he must be out for, for himself and the railroad for ill gain. But he was correct. Why should a railroad, a freight railroad, be stuck with the huge costs of commuter operation, which, which is a money losing thing? Why would a railroad stay in that business? And the only reason they had to stay in it was because of the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities would not let them get rid of the trains. Now, they were successful partly in 1958 and 59. They dumped Swampscott Branch. Over those two years, they dumped all the trains to Peabody and Danvers. They dumped the Saugus Branch. Um, they closed down everything north of Reading anything north of Reading that had to go say to Portland, of which there were not many, but they ran those all around Winchester and up on the Wildcat. So they were closing that section of track. They, they just pruned things as much as they could. And the state had no idea at all in 1959 that within a very few years, they would be running the commuter rail. No, no, didn't mean it. Nobody thought that. But once faced with the reality that the railroad was simply not going to run it anymore, people got religion real fast. But it is a shame because that network was so useful and North Station with 23 tracks was so useful. But once you rip up those commuter lines, it's really, really hard to put them back. But if that service had never been discontinued, it's possible that we would have some of it today. On the other hand, uh, McGinnis left the Woburn service in place, and it was the MBTA that closed that down, as well as the Bedford line got closed down, and Lexington. And that was because they I think they decided there wasn't enough business to bother given the costs of keeping the line open in weather like that. I think they were just running one train a day to Bedford. But, you know, um, it's a shame that's not there because today there would probably be many more trains needed. We have a very nice rail trail. Absolutely. So I think uh, we're down to three minutes, uh, Robert. So, I'll probably start to wrap us up. Did you have any final points or Rick, did you have any uh, final items you wanted to chime in with or? No, we, I think we covered far more than I, than I had. So that's, that's wonderful. Robert, I, you know, thank you for uh, sharing this, uh, all this knowledge of yours tonight and all your anecdotes and experiences. You're absolutely welcome. It's a pleasure. I love talking about this stuff. Well, that's all we have time for today. We hope you enjoyed today's show. And as always, if you're interested in learning more about the Boston and Maine Railroad Historical Society or joining us, you can visit our website, www.bmrrhs.org. <laughs>